Hello, and welcome to Bible Class Topics. I'm Carrie Dillinger, and I will be the presenter for the study. In this series of video lessons, we'll be studying various Bible subjects. For our first set of videos, I've chosen a topic that I recently shared with a Bible class I have been teaching at church, namely Matthew's Gospel. In this first lesson, we will give some resources, set an overall outline of the book, and make some comparisons between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's begin our study. The resources I've chosen for this study include the Holy Bible, the English Standard Version. The ESV is included with the free version of the Olive Tree Bible app available for Windows and Apple devices. I put a link in the description below. Let me give this short disclaimer. Hardly any of the ideas presented in these lessons come solely from my own mind. I have extensively referred to the following commentaries, among others, to compose these Bible class notes. Because I have not footnoted, it would be plagiarism to pass these notes off as my own work. The first books that I've used to study is the Gospel of Matthew, Volumes 1 and 2 by William Barclay. If you search Amazon.com, you'll find many used copies of this commentary available at reasonable prices. Secondly, I've studied Kenneth L. Chumley's book, The Gospel of Matthew. Mr. Chumley has recently revised his original work on Matthew, and you can search Amazon for either the older edition, which will be somewhat cheaper, and the new edition. Besides these books, I would recommend for your own personal study that you download the following free PDF documents. Harmony of the Gospels by Rick Ashman and the Fourfold Gospel by McGarvey and Pendleton. I've included the link to these documents in the description below. Also in the description below, I have included a link to the Church of Christ at Beverly Shores where I have been presenting these lessons on Sunday and Wednesday night. As we begin our introduction and want to talk about evidence of authorship, specifically the, Apo uh, the Apostle Matthew, I would like to share with you part of the introduction to the Gospel from the MacArthur Study Bible, New King James Version. They begin their introduction by quoting John 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The English word gospel derives from an Anglo-Saxon word which can mean either a story about God or a good story. The latter meaning is in harmony with the Greek word that's translated gospel, which means the good news. In secular Greek, this word referred to a good report about an important event. The four Gospels, then, are good news about the most significant events in all of history. The life, the sacrificial death, and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospels, however, are not biographies in the modern sense of the word, since they do not intend to present a complete life of Jesus. Apart from the birth narratives, they give little information about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. While Jesus' public ministry lasted over three years, 
The Gospels focus much of their attention on the last week of his life. Though they are completely accurate historically and present important biographical details of Jesus' life, the primary purpose of the Gospels is to provide authoritative answers to questions about Jesus' life and ministry and to strengthen believers' assurance regarding the reality of their faith. Although many spurious Gospels were written, the Church from earliest times has accepted only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as inspired Scripture. While each Gospel has a unique perspective, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when compared to John, share a common point of view. Because of that, they are known as synoptic, from a Greek word meaning to see together or to share a common point of view. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for example, focus on Christ's Galilean ministry, while John focuses on his ministry in Judea. The Synoptic Gospels contain numerous parables, while John records none. John and the Synoptic Gospels record only two common events prior to Passion Week, Jesus walking on the water and the feeding of the 5,000. These differences between John and the Synoptic Gospels, however, are not contradictory but they are complementary. Each gospel writer wrote from a unique perspective and for a different audience. As a result, each gospel contains distinctive elements. Taken together, the four gospels weave a complete portrait of the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth. In him were blended perfect humanity and deity making him the only sacrifice for the sins of the world and the worthy Lord of those who believe on his name. Now we shall move into our general study, our general introduction of the Gospel according to Matthew. There's two types of evidence that lead us to believe that Matthew the Apostle is indeed the author of this gospel. Number one, there's external evidence. It was accepted that Matthew is the author by the early church, and later into the second and third century, the so-called church fathers agreed. Internally, the earliest Greek manuscripts carry the title according to Matthew. Let's say some more about the Synoptic Gospels. This quote, able to be seen together, this definition of the word synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke present essentially the same material in the same arrangement. Comparing them side by side brings this point home. Such passages as the feeding of the 5,000 and the man healed from palsy are almost identical in the telling. This leads us to believe that these three Gospels sprang from the same source. The earliest Gospel is Mark. It's the shortest of the three Gospels. His material is more often repeated by the other two, or at least by one of them. Of course, if Matthew and Luke are longer, they contain more material. However, they sometimes speak in stronger terms than Mark. For example, compare Mark 1.34 with Matthew 8.16 and Luke 4.40. You might want to pause the video at this moment and study those passages and then come back and join me again. While you're out there, compare Mark 10.35 with Matthew 20.20. 20. Sometimes we note that Matthew and Luke shift the emphasis or even downplay things stressed by Mark, such as Jesus' emotion. Did you look at Mark 10.35 and Matthew 20.20? 20, 
Did you notice that in one passage, it says the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and asked him a question about who might be on his right and left hand in the kingdom? But in the other passage, it says that their mother came with them and asked Jesus this question. Much of the extra material supplied by Matthew and Luke is identical and concerns the teaching of Jesus. This contrasts with what Matthew and Luke share with Mark, which typically concerns Jesus' life instead of his words. I want to take a closer look at the four pictures of Christ. Christ's greatness could not be described in one book. According to John, even what has been written does not do justice to Christ. Matthew's gospel concerns itself with the relationship of Jesus to the Jews. Matthew shows how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, judges the Jews for their hypocrisy, is the son of David, is the promised Messiah, and is the rabbi of all rabbis. Meanwhile, Mark's gospel emphasizes action and stresses suffering on the part of the Messiah and the disciples. This gospel shows that Jesus would be a spiritual leader, not a secular leader. Luke's gospel stresses the blessings of salvation brought by Jesus Christ. It emphasizes Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and shows that the gospel is for the common man. John's gospel shows that Jesus was sent by the Heavenly Father to be the Savior of the earth and that he came with the full authority of heaven even though he came to earth as a man. Looking a little more carefully at each of the Gospels, we note that Matthew, as the author of his Gospel, was one of the twelve, also known as Levi. He was a Jew and a publican, which was a Roman tax collector. He followed Jesus when he was called, he held a feast for Christ. He primarily is writing to the Jews. We see this alluded to in Matthew 10, 5 and 6 and Matthew 15, 24. The purpose of his gospel is to show that Christ was indeed the Messiah of Jewish prophecy. And note the use of the words fulfilled, king, and kingdom. Four distinctive features of Matthew are the ten parables. The tares, the hidden treasure, the pearl, the dragnet, the hard-hearted servant, workers in the vineyard, the two sons, the marriage of the king's sons, the ten bridesmaid, and the talents. Matthew mentions three miracles, the two blind men, the dumb man who was possessed, and the coin in the fish's mouth. Matthew mentions nine incidents, Joseph's dream, the wise men's visit, the escape to Egypt, Herod's massacre, Pilate's wife's dream, the death of Judas, also recorded in the book of Acts, the saints resurrected in Jerusalem, the bribing of the guard, and the great commission. Various teachings include the most famous passage in Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. The author of Mark's Gospel is identified as the son of Mary of Jerusalem, also called John Mark. We know from Colossians 4 and verse 10, he was a relative of Barnabas. And we know that he was associated with Paul on the first missionary journey. It was during this missionary journey that he became temporarily alienated from Paul. But we see in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11 that his friendship with Paul was eventually restored. When we see a passage like 1 Peter 5.13, it tells us that secular history and tradition is probably correct when it places Mark as a companion of Peter in the later years. 
The Gospel of Mark is possibly addressed to the Christians in Rome, and that's suggested to us by the lack of prophecy fulfillment and ex explanatory material included that would be needed by the Gentiles. Passages such as Mark 3.17, 5.41, chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, verse 11, and verse 34. The main theme of the book of Mark is Christ, the tireless servant of God and man, and his emphasis is on Christ's deeds. Distinctive features, it is the shortest gospel. It's written in a vivid, dynamic style. It lets the work of Christ testify to his deity. And passages such as Mark 1.13 and 3.17 show us it's the most personal gospel. And passages such as Mark 3.5 and 4.38 allude to Christ's humanity. Even though he has the shortest gospel, Mark lists 19 miracles. Eight miracles showing power over disease, five showing power over nature, four showing authority over demons, and two, showing conquest over death. The author of Luke's gospel, Luke, identified in Colossians 4.14 as the beloved physician, is also the author of the book of Acts. We know that he was a close friend and companion of Paul, and Paul's influence can be seen in his writing. This gospel, as well as the book of Acts, are addressed to one Theophilus, identified as probably a Gentile. Since Luke takes time to explain Jewish customs, it is assumed that the book was itself written primarily to the Gentiles. For the purpose, let's quote directly from Luke himself. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. I've highlighted the three main purposes of Luke writing this gospel, so that a narrative would, of the things accomplished would be available, that it would be written in an orderly fashion, and that it would cause Theophilus faith to be stronger, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Distinctive features of Luke's gospel is that he emphasizes the universal grace of God. He uses the phrase, the Son of Man, and it's a devotional gospel emphasizing prayer. There are three parables in Luke concerning prayer. Luke 11, 5 through 8, Luke 18, 1 through 8, and Luke 18, 9 through 14. Luke gives us quite a few prayers of Christ. Luke 3, 21, 5, 16, 6, 12, 9, 29, 11, 1, 22, 32, and 44, and 23, 46. Chapters 1 and 2 lend themselves to a study of joy and praise. And chapters 1 and 10 show how Luke honors womanhood. Almost half the material in the book of Luke is only found in the book of Luke. Examples of incidents such as the draught of fishes, raising the widow's son, the ten lepers, and the fact that in the garden at the betrayal, Peter drew a sword and cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant, and that Jesus healed that ear. Luke gives us 16 parables, including the fig tree, the prayer parables, and the rich man, and Lazarus. Finally, let's look at John's Gospel. 
The author is the Apostle John. He's the son of Zebedee, and he's the beloved disciple, and he's the brother of James. He was a member of the so-called inner circle with his brother and Peter. And at the cross, Jesus entrusted John with the care of his own mother. This gospel does not appear to be addressed to any one group, but it does fill in much material that the other so-called synoptic gospels do not contain. John makes it clear that his purpose is to inspire the readers to faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Six distinctive features include that it's considered to be the deepest of the Gospels, that Christ reveals himself more completely in his person and attributes, in his divinity, in the work of the Holy Spirit, in his divine commission, and concerning God the Father. John has much more emphasis on the last days than the other Gospels. And there are certain conversations found only in John, such as Nicodemus and the woman at the well. John chapter 10 gives us the discourse on the Good Shepherd. John includes eight miracles, six which are unique to his gospel. Water to wine, healing the nobleman's son, blind man at the pool, the man born blind, raising Lazarus, the second draught of fishes. And the two great themes of his gospel are faith and eternal life. Let's get back to Matthew, one of the twelve apostles. His place in the gospel tradition. As stated earlier, tradition has it that Matthew collected the material presented in this gospel. Liberal scholars will, of course, disagree, attributing this gospel to some secretary or biographer of Matthew. We will be taking the more conservative approach in this study, and we give all the credit to Matthew and his inspiration by the Holy Spirit to deliver this gospel to us. We've already mentioned that the fact that this gospel contains the complete Sermon on the Mount makes it a gospel that is often turned to when people want to hear the direct teachings of Jesus. So if Mark gave us the events of Jesus' life, then Matthew gave us his teachings. No Jew was more hated by his own people than a tax collector working for the Romans. And yet, Matthew was indeed a tax collector. While many of the apostles were what some would say ignorant fishermen, Matthew was an educated man. He was used to dealing with account books and able to work with numbers and the written word. The Gospel of Matthew was written by a Jew to convince Jews. He demonstrated that Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled in Christ. Sixteen times this phrase occurs in Matthew. The phrase, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. I want to read you something from Barclay's commentary. That phrase occurs in the gospel as often as sixteen times. Jesus' birth and Jesus' name are a fulfillment of prophecy. So are the flight to Egypt, the slaughter of the children, Joseph's settlement in Nazareth and Jesus' upbringing there, Jesus' use of parables, the triumphal entry, the betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, the casting of lots for Jesus' garments as he hung on the cross. It is Matthew's primary and deliberate purpose to show how the Old Testament prophecies receive their fulfillment in Jesus, how every detail of Jesus' life was foreshadowed in the prophets, and thus to compel the Jews to admit that Jesus was the Messiah. His purpose, then, as Barclay points out, was to show Jesus as the Messiah of prophecy. We note from passages such as 
Matthew 15, 24, and 10, 5, and 6 that the Jews are Matthew's main interest. But he does not exclude the Gentiles. Passages such as 8, 11, 24, 14, and 28, 19 bear this out. As Paul sometimes says, though, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. And by the Greeks, Paul means the Gentiles. What's the gospel's attitude towards the law? Well, Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And what is Jesus' attitude toward the scribes and Pharisees? There's a paradox here, because Matthew records so much of Jesus' condemnation of these men. Let me read one more quick passage from Barclay concerning this. They are given a very special authority by Jesus. In chapter 23, verse 2, Jesus says the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you. But at the same time, there is no gospel which so sternly and consistently condemns, condemns them. Right at the beginning, there is John the Baptist's savage denunciation of them as a brood of vipers. They complain that Jesus eats with the tax collectors and sinners. They ascribe the power of Jesus not to God, but to the prince of devils. They plot to destroy him. The disciples are warned against the leaven, that is the evil teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. They are like evil plants doomed to be rooted up. They are quite unable to read the signs of the times. They are the murderers of the prophets. There is no chapter of condemnation in the whole New Testament like Matthew chapter 23, which is a condemnation not of what the scribes and the Pharisees teach, but of what they are. He condemns them for falling so far short of their own teaching and far below the ideal of what they or any follower of God ought to be. Above all, Matthew is interested in teaching concerning God's kingdom. In chapter 5 through 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 10, the duties of the leaders of the kingdom. In chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom. In chapter 18, the greatness and the forgiveness that happens when someone enters into the kingdom. And finally, in chapters 24 through 25, he teaches us on the coming of the king. Matthew presents his gospel in a special arrangement. Since Matthew was written at a time when most people could not afford to possess a book, Matthew organized his book with built-in memory devices. How many messages were to Joseph? How many denials of Peter? And how many questions of Pilate are recorded? How many parables of the kingdom appear in chapter 13? How many woes are to the scribes and Pharisees in chapter 23? We see the use of the memory device of threes and sevens in Matthew's gospel. Then in the arrangement of the genealogy in chapter 1, to prove that Jesus is the son of David, Matthew lists the genealogy in three groups of 14. When we think of the dominating idea of Matthew's gospel, that dominating idea is Jesus is king. The genealogy is given to prove he's David's son, a title Matthew uses more than any other gospel writer. We see the story of the wise men coming and looking for the king of the Jews. Jesus stages the triumphal entry deliberately and dramatically so that he can claim to be king. When he stands before Pilate, Jesus accepts the name king. And a mocking sign declaring him king is hung above his head on the cross. 
In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses the saying, but I say unto you. That is a statement in which he is giving himself authority. And then, of course, in Matthew 28, as he closes the book, he says, all authority has been given unto me. Here's a quick outline of how we want to look at the study. In the first chapter, through the middle of chapter 4, we'll talk about the coming of the king. Then, in the middle of chapter 4 to the middle of chapter 16, we'll study the proclaiming of the kingdom. The bulk of our study, however, will take place between chapter 16 and chapter 26, where we see Jesus facing rejection and enduring the cross. And finally, we'll spend some time in chapter 28 talking about Jesus conquering death once and for all. Please join me next time as we begin our study of Matthew chapter 1. I will try my best to post the next video by 7 a.m. Eastern Time each Monday. Thank you for watching. Please support my effort by liking or disliking this video and click the subscribe button if you support this channel. In the meantime, keep me in your prayers. I will keep you in my prayers and may God bless.